the invite and uh, look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And uh, I think with uh, Harrison speaking this morning, you're going to find that this can be very uh, informational. Yeah. The next person I'd like to introduce is Mike. He is um, associated with Y Combinator. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and also tell us a little bit about that. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Mike. I'm the founder and CEO of Cohere. We're an online marketplace connecting emerging consumer brands with micro retailers, so places like cafe, restaurants, gym, fitness studios. And then we let any brand sell locally anywhere in the world, cheaply and affordably and very quickly. And then so, yeah, this, uh, this is my second time coming to the uh, Friday Coffee meetup. And then it's great. Looking forward to it. Let's see you, Harrison. Can you mention something about Y Combinator earlier? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're affiliated with that, and also my cousin went through that cohort three times as well, so we know a lot of founders, and then in the future we hope to build a more like entrepreneurial community here in uh, Pasadena. Thank you, Mike. And in Wyo Combinator, plug and play, these are a couple of the more successful incubators and accelerators up in Northern California, and they were affiliated with Facebook and PayPal. All those kind of companies, I believe. Anyhow, uh, one last uh, introduction is uh, Lori, since she's been here before. Uh, Lori, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, I went. I came here to this group. Um, I guess it was over three years ago. I used to come on Friday mornings. So I am a former entrepreneur. I founded a company called Two Chefs on a Roll, and it was food manufacturing. We did private label custom. Uh, sauces, dips, and desserts, and I sold that business. And since then, I've been mentoring other small businesses and investing in small businesses. So um, that's my interest in being a part of this group. Thank you very much, Lori. I think with your entrepreneurial background, it would be very helpful for some of these startup companies. And with that, I will turn it back to Christy so that we can get our talk started. Perfect. Thank you, John. Great to meet some new people and see some familiar faces. We are so pleased to have Harrison Tang with us here this morning. He is the CEO of Spokio. He is going to be talking to us about Web 3.0 and decentralization. So it's going to be a very interesting, informative conversation this morning. Harrison has actually spoken for us before, back in the early days of Friday Coffee Meetup. And so we are really pleased to welcome him back to the stage. Please join me in welcoming Harrison. Well, thank you, uh, Christy, and thank you, uh, John, uh, for your kind introductions. And thanks, everyone, for coming here uh, to uh, hear me kind of share my thoughts on the identity Web3 or the future of who we are in the next evolution of the web. Um, actually, a couple, couple years back, actually almost a decade ago, I think I spoke about the game theory loops and gamifications at the last uh, coffee meetup, Friday coffee meetup. So I'm very, very glad here to uh, share kind of newest and latest technologies that I've been kind of uh, looking into in the last uh, four or five years. And then kind of share about uh, what we're, where we're going, right? In terms of answering the question, one of the six W's in the English language, the question of who, um, you know, in the next, uh, I would say, five to 10 years. Okay, before I begin, like, I just want to ask, like, how many of you guys are technical? Because I have on tailor today's presentation, uh, either to a technical audience or less technical audience. So if you're technical, like, can you kind of raise your hands? Okay, got it. All right. So I'm going to uh, keep it a little bit not technical. And, uh, and then if you have further questions about any of the technical details, just uh, just uh, ask in the Q and A, or uh, actually just uh, grab me afterwards. All right. So a little quick about myself. So I'm Harrison Tang. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spokio. I'm the dad of three sons, and uh, actually that title should probably go beforehand because that, that that's a very very tough job actually. Um, you know, as a CEO, people listen to you, but as a dad, they don't. <laughs> and then I'm also the co-chair of W3C Credentials Community Group. So W3C is the uh, open standards community that sets standards for the web. So this community group focuses on uh, credentials, which is basically uh, data about us, right? Data about someone. So about us, uh, we are a people intelligence service and digital identity platform. We 
aggregate over 16 billion records into 600 million entities. Um, and we serve about 15 million users to search, connect uh, with others and know who they're dealing with. We're basing Pasadena, actually across the street from Hilton, and we have about 180 people and we do, we do about $90 million a year. So before we talk about identity and Web3, since we're a data company, we like to be very exact with our definition. So what is identity? Well, identity in the plain English language usually stands for characteristics, attributes about someone, right? About a distinct entity, right? And I'll add a third dimension to it, which is the, the concept of access control. So to complete that, the definition of identity is accessible data and characteristics that define a distinct entity. So there are three dimensions to this definition. The first one is people data, obviously, data attributes, right? So it can be name, contact info, personality, right? In data science, um, they like to use the term features, right? They're all pretty much the same. In data engineering, they call it columns, attributes. Um, so there's a lot of columns, attributes, dimensions uh, about somebody, right? It doesn't have to be just about name, contact info. It can be personality. It can be your credit score, financial information, so on, so on, so on. This data can come from first party, which is the user themselves, second party, people or entities related to that particular user, or third party, independent third party. And that data needs to tie to the idea of entity. So entity is basically the idea of being, okay? So in a philosophy, there's one pillar called metaphysics, the idea of what it is, right? The idea of being. And this is actually a, a very, very important concept because in the physical world, the entity you can see, you can touch, but in the digital world, that's not how it works. In fact, a digital entity is an artificial construct, okay? So a digital entity um, that looks into, that aggregates multiple entities, and the entity can be your Facebook profile, it can be your criminal records, so on, so on, so on. Okay, when you create, when there's a digital entity or identifier that combines all of them, right, that, that identifies the identity graph for that particular entity, that is an artificial construct. That is the result of the, process called entity resolution. So the idea of entity is actually a very, very deep one. And lastly, access control. So making sure that the right people can have the right access to the right data, but to the right resources, right? So that's the concept of authorization, okay? Authentication, which is about making sure that the physical cell can link to a proper link and access to the digital cell, kind of using in electrical engineering, the idea of digital analog to digital conversion, that's the authentication. These are all part of the access control concept. When we talk about data privacy, which is the sharing, the level of data sharing to one's, about oneself or one school. Okay. That's a soci sociology, a social psychology definition. That is part of access control too. So when we're talking about identity, we really need to break this big problem into smaller chunks, right? So when we're talking about privacy, it's about access control. When we're talking about the concept of being, that's entity resolution. And lastly, when we're talking about data aggregation, data truth, what is true, what is not, that's about data attributes and people data. Identity is very, very important, you know, because it empowers many different use cases. Identity today, and the focus on today, I will talk about sci-fi dreams later or in the future, but identity today is the how to the what, the means to the end. And that mean can empower many different use cases where there's 8% of the searches online about somebody, okay, people search, or finding long lost families and friends or ancestors from the past, you know, thousand years, uh, hundreds of years. <laughs> You know, that people are people too, right? Genealogy research, fraud prevention, making sure that the person who's purchasing your product is actually the real person and okay? not a fake one. Fraud prevention, financial crime compliance, that includes know your customer compliance, KYC, 
AML stands for anti-money laundering and so on, so on, so on. Credit cards and payments. MasterCard two years ago said that payments networks is a type of, a dimension of identity network, right? So payments is fundamentally about identity as well. Authentication, you know, there's this hype about death of passwords, which I don't abide to, and I can talk about why later, but uh, the hype about death of passwords, FIDO standards and all that stuff, that's, that's about authentication. Identity protection, marketing, that's a huge, huge, huge case, okay? Uh, marketing analytics, that's like a $50 billion uh, industry on marketing analytics alone. So identity market is huge, right? If you actually talk about what identity empowers, you know, when you actually get into uh, a website, you sign up, you register, you log in, you do password recovery. That's called customer identity access and management, or people like to use acronyms, CIAM. <laughs> CIAM, right? That, that is a huge market too. That's about uh, $1 billion right there. Okay. So identity is a huge, huge uh, market. And, uh, and it actually has major implications too. Um, the founder of the internet, originally the vision is about connecting people. It's not about connecting devices and IP addresses. Okay. But because the problem of identity is so hard, we didn't get to that. So we end up with HTML, HTTPS, those kinds of standards that connects devices, not people. So there's always this goal to try to create the identity layer for the internet. And um, 20, 30 years in, we're still at it, but I think we're closer to that dream than ever. So these are just uh, put some numbers uh, to earlier what I'm talking about. The whole point is it's a huge market, right? I mean, if you think about it, this number is actually kind of small. If you're thinking about what we're trying to solve here, we're trying to solve one of the fundamental questions in human language, not just in English, in Chinese, in everything, right? One of the six W's, right, in human language. So now we define identity as accessible data about a distinct entity. Let's talk about what is identity in Web3. And before we talk about what is identity in Web3, we have to define what is Web3. Okay, so you look at the YouTube channels and all that stuff. There's a lot, a lot of definitions. Some people equate Web3 to cryptocurrencies. And personally, I think that definition is a little bit narrow-minded. I think the key thing about Web3 is this idea of decentralization. The idea that the control is not uh, pertaining to a single or few individuals, right? but rather to thousands, or if not every single one of us, which is tens of billions of people, tens of billions of entities in this world. That's the fundamental concept of Web3. It's about redefining what digital ownership means. And ownership is defined as the state of, or the fact of legal possession or control over properties, okay? So we need to talk, when we talk about all these things, we need to be very, very exact about these definitions, right? Otherwise, we're going to be uh, talking about different things. Otherwise, there will be miscommunication, all right? So Web3 fundamentally is the idea of the emergence of digital ownership that empowers decentralization of different systems. Ultimately, that's what it is. And I think tokenopic, to tokenomics, which is uh, pertaining to cryptocurrencies and things like that, is just a reflection of these concepts. I think the best definition and analogy I like to, I like the, the most, is that if web one, the first web is about reading, Right. It's about read uh, using I.O. definitions and analogy. If the first web is about read, empowering users to consume the content, the web two in the mid 2000s and early 2010s is about read and write, not just about the consumption of content, but also the generation of content by every single one of us, or so-called user generated content. Now, what's Web3? What's next? The next is read, write, and own. The emergence of, of this concept of ownership. So 
Uh, I think some of you guys probably know about CCPA, California Privacy Law, or GDPR, that came out about four years ago. These sets the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Data Rights for every single individual, and that is one of the foundations of the ownership. And I think as we move forward, we can, you know, these kind of concepts will continue to evolve, and that will be the foundation of Web3. That is the next web. So now we define identity. We've defined Web3. So what's identity Web3? Well, identity Web3 essentially is decentralized identity because if Web3 is about decentralization and identity, then it's decentralized identity. It's that simple. And that's breaking to break this problem into smaller chunks by these dimensions, you know, that I just mentioned. So the first part is decentralized entity. Today, your entity is controlled by other big tech or governments, okay? It's, uh, for example, your uh, Twitter, your Twitter account that's controlled by Twitter. So if Twitter doesn't like you or Twitter doesn't like Donald Trump, then that particular handle is shut down. <laughs> so you're not in control of that handle, right? Your social security number is controlled by the government. Right? Uh, your Spokio ID is actually an artificial construct created by Spokio, you know? So, how do we decentralize that? There is a new technology called decentralized identifiers that leverages cryptographic proof to allow users with the control over that particular identifier so that no one is in control of that identifier. You are in control of your own entity. So that's decentralized entity. Decentralized data aggregation. There are technologies such as verifiable credentials. I'll get into that more because that happened to be my favorite new identity technologies, okay? Personal ID that store IPFS. IPFS stands for interplanetary, interplanetary file systems, right? So it's a very, very cool name. Love that. Uh, <laughs> those are decentralization of data storage and decentralization of data aggregation. And lastly, decentralized access, self-sovereign identity, self-issue open ID provider, blah, 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 those kind of things. I'll get into that in more details later. So why decentralized identity? I think decentralized identity will overtake. Okay? It's not going to kill the current paradigm, but it will overtake and become the standard common paradigm for the entire world because one, data regulation, right? CCPA, GDPR, so on, so on, so on. Data quality, okay? It's not just about the compliance, okay? Compliance is a cost mindset. So how does decentralized identity generate revenue? Yeah. You no, know, attack is the best defense, right? The best defense is attack. So how do you actually generate revenue? Data quality. Right. Today, most of the identity verification is done through what's called third-party data valid uh, validation. So Spokio is being used a lot by e-commerce companies to making sure that those customers, right, the new customers are who they say they are. Yeah. But that's a third-party data validation. But if you can combine third-party with first-party and second-party together, that's great, you know, that's the holy grail, right? So data quality, that's directly generating um, uh, reasons why decentralized identity will be the future. Network effect, uh, identity inherently is a multi-sided platform, right? And multi-sided platform inherently has virality built in, right? So network effect, and lastly, Web3 movement. I heard a lot of Web3 ideas and uh, personally, I think some of them sounds kind of stupid. <laughs> but I went to this Web3 conference. I realized this is going to be the future because I realized that I'm the, one of the oldest people right, in, that, in that conference. And I realized that I probably am like my dad back in the late 1990s. He thought a lot of the ideas that's moving online you know, is pretty stupid, <laughs> and they are, right? <laughs> uh, but what he didn't realize is that in marketing terms, he's not a trendsetter. In marketing, trendsetter is 23 to 30, 30, early 30s, okay? They set the trend of the future, not a 40-year-old like me. So when a whole new generation has this mistrust of big tech and governments, 
and they want to take back control and decentralize everything. You know what? That will happen. That will happen. Despite all the ideas that sound so stupid and most of them is not going to work out, but that will be the trend because ultimately, when a whole new generation is going to make something happen, it will happen. That happened in the 2000s with the first internet. That happened with the second internet where the social media disrupted publishing and that will happen again in Web3. And that's why I believe in Web3. Not necessarily because all the cryptocurrencies and all that stuff. I don't own any cryptocurrency because uh, uh, I don't have time. <laughs> it's kind of funny. People are like, hey, do you buy these cryptocurrencies? I actually said I, I, I bought none because I didn't have time to buy uh, all of them. Uh, any of them actually and uh, i was just studying about blockchains and consensus algorithms and I, I, I know the tech but i didn't buy anything right so um most of these ideas uh probably not gonna make it but i think this trend is going to persist because of the, this is a cultural movement in my opinion so now we talk about identity in web3 let's talk about the core concept of of uh, one of the most important concepts in decentralized identity, which is this idea of self sovereign identity. So today's identity access model, right? First of all, let's define what identity access model is. So earlier I've talked about identity being a multi-sided platform. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about uh, network theories, right, and security models and things like that, there's uh, many, many participants and contributors to the network. And you want to have a role-based access model. So what you do is you cluster these contributors into different roles. In a simplistic term, identity role-based access model can be clustered into three roles. Okay. The first role is the searcher and the verifier, people who are going to make the search or access this data. The second role is the data subject, the person being searched. And the last one is the issuer. A lot of people they make this assumption that identity about you is created by you. Well, guess what? Most of them is not. And here's a very classical example. If I'm an Uber driver, my Uber profile is not created by me. And by the way, the ratings about me is not created by me too, right? So in this case, your Uber profile is essentially, your, the Uber is essentially the issuer of your Uber profile. And one could argue that the writers are the issuers, right? The issuer, the original source of that identity information about you. So this is a key concept, is the decoupling of issuer and data subject, right? Identity in philosophy is about how entity interact with its environment. So the entity by itself cannot be an identity. In other words, when you capture the interaction of with that particular entity to other entities, right? That's 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 identity. Okay, so so you need to uh, you need to consider and model all these interactions, and I think this is one of the best uh, models, right? Access models describing uh, identity as a multi-sided platform, and once you understand that, you can figure out exactly how does we, how do we empower billions of data subjects right, to take control of their identity? Well, let's talk about how the current identity model works. So when you want to do an anonymous search, right now, the searcher just go directly to the issuer and no one, you know, uh, the data subject is not involved and you don't know that exists, right? Or in identity verification, when you sign up for a service, uh, a lot of uh, big services, they will call a third-party data validation, right? The validators to make sure that you are who you say you are. Now, if that happens in the background, you have no idea that that happened. Right? When you're doing uh, logins, right? Facebook logins and so on, so on, so on, right? In this case, right, you are redirect to big tech like Facebook, Google, logins and things like that. You sign in and then it comes back. In this case, you know that it's happening, but that said, your identity is not controlled by you. Your identity is controlled by the big tech because big tech is the intermediary of this multi-sided platform. As we know, the intermediary of any marketplace holds the ultimate power. Okay. 
This is another one, right? Another example. Uh, when you do employment screening, uh, FCRA regular employment screening, uh, the company is the intermediary, right? You say, hey, the company said, hey, can I do a background check, employment screening on you? You say yes, and then the company go grab the data and make sure that you are who you say you are. In this case, the company is the intermediary. So how do we actually empower the control to the data subject, billions of us? Well, you just flip this model, no, <laughs> on its head. Essentially, you empower the data subject to be the intermediary of identity-related transactions. So when there is a verification check, right, the verifiers and searchers interact with the data subject directly, and the data subject grabs, or maybe they already hold such credentials, and credentials are basically claims or data attributes about you or about a certain person the data subject holds or grabs, right, uh, gets the credentials from the issuers and then present that to the verifier. So it's kind of like how the physical wallet works today, right? So you get the, the DMV, right? Your driver license uh, issued by the DMV in your wallet. And when, hopefully not, that when you get pulled over by the police, you present that, right? The police didn't call like DMV, right, to verify that. You pre present that credential, you present that driver license at the spot. You are in control of the identity-related transactions. So if the whole world, all identity transactions move toward this paradigm, effectively speaking, you are in control of your identity. And the, I, the dream of self-sovereign, self-sovereignty or self-sovereign identity will be achieved. And the dream of the ultimate identity in Web3 will happen. Because if you think about it, decentralization in the most popular distributed ledger network or so-called blockchain has about 300,000 nodes. That's nice. But 300,000, you might, you know, doing a simple math is five or six orders magnitude smaller than billions of people, right? So <laughs> which one is more decentralized? I think South sovereign identity in the identity context is a lot more decentralized than blockchain technology. So when people talk about blockchain being the next big thing, right, uh, in identity, I have my questions and my doubts, and I can talk about those details uh, if you have further questions. So because today is not a tech-focused thing, so I'm not going to go into details of these technologies. Uh, but uh, I'll just uh, call out uh, a certain new technologies that uh, I believe is the pillars of the identity in Web3. The first one is verifiable credentials. And the key to verifiable credential is leveraging cryptographic proof to empower transitive trust. So what does that mean? Well, what that, what that means is because, uh, first of all, crypt cryptographic proof one of the applications of cryptographic proof is digital signatures. So when you do digital signatures on top of sign on the credential, when the searchers and verifiers check that credential, right, they don't have to home phone to the issuers again. You know, they, they because they trust the digital signatures, the validity of the uh, digital signature, right? They don't need to interact with the issuer again. And that's what I mean by transitive trust, okay? The trust doesn't need to be established on the spot. They don't need to interact with the issuers. The searchers and verifiers can just check the credentials directly from the data subject without checking the, the, uh, the issuers' uh, databases and things like that in real time. So that's, that's what's, what I mean by transitive trust. It's kind of transitive properties in like additions and subtractions. Basically, that's what it is. So the fundamental Innovations of verifiable credentials is leveraging that to empower transitive trust, enabling self-sovereign identity. And this one is the, uh, in my opinion, the most fundamental and most disruptive technologies of all identity in Web3 technologies. Verifiable credential is a concept in verifiable, uh, sorry, verifiable presentation is a concept in verifiable credentials uh, standard. And the idea here is quite important because it segregates the concept of credentials from presentation. And what is a presentation? 
presentation is an aggregate of credentials. And this is quite important. The reason is because um, your identity is a facet of your persona. It basically is a persona, okay? And your persona is consists of multiple different credentials or claims about you, right? So if you don't have such segregation, then you will not be able to have a, a granular control over what you want to present. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, for example, when you go on dating, you kind of want a dating persona, right? When you go, go to a work, you want a professional persona and so on and so on. So the segregation of presentation and uh, credentials enables that uh, granular control. Other details will be zero knowledge proof, selective disclosures, uh, derived predicates and things like that. That gives you more tools to, to uh, selectively uh, control what you want to share to whom at what time. So this is a very, very important concept. So I call it out directly, but this is actually part of the verifiable credentials data model uh, standard. Uh, there's a new one, decentralized identifier. So it's leveraging cryptographic proof to allow the data subject or whoever to control the identifier. And you can actually anchor the identifier on blockchains to empower further decentralization of the, in this case, decentralization of public key infrastructures. Entity by solution, I touched upon that a little bit earlier. So it's the idea of how do you actually aggregate all these entities and create an artificial construct of digital identity. Mm -hmm. Authentication, which is uh, the linkage between the physical self to the digital self. And the key thing is there are multiple dimensions and factors, right? And the factors are inherence, which is biometric, who you are, biometric, facial, biometrics, fingerprints, and things like that. Knowledge, what you know. So password is a type of knowledge factor, if you think about it. Uh, knowledge-based authentication, secret phrase, and so on and so on. Possessions, devices, like SMS uh, verification, that actually verifies the device, not the individual. So that's uh, technically a possession factor. Locations, who you are in proxy, which is uh, basically, hey, you know, I'm not, as a company, I'm not great at authentication, so I might as, as well outsource it to big tech. So these are the authentication factors, and these technologies ensure the identity assurance level, right, between the physical self and the digital self. All right, so I highlighted, uh, quickly go over these five key technologies in identity, and if you want to learn more, you can follow me on the CEO dad, right, on different social media or 10 talks on TikToks, and uh, if you want to learn more on what Spokio is doing, you can also follow us on social media as well. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. We can um, stop the sharing on here and then that way they can see your face. I'm gonna switch mics with you. Give this one to John. One to you. Okay, this one is getting turned on. Okay, yep, there you go. Okay. And then Evan's going to be handling the online. Okay, well, let's get started with the uh, Q&A. Uh, before I do that, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Pueblo Tantra for bringing the uh, Thai MC and the uh, Milky uh, for joining us for our group meeting with Harrison Tom. So uh, please bring them on Wednesday here in Pasadena. And uh, we're going to be allowed to get started with the uh, questions. We, or else I'm going to start asking some questions. Here we go. I kind of know that this question is going to come up, especially things uh, two months ago, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, Butlin, um, uh, Vitalik Butlin, who is the founder of Ethereum, uh, talks about the idea of soul bound NFT, right? So leveraging NFT technologies uh, as part of your identity. So first of all, we need to talk about what NFT is. Um, NFT fundamentally is just a hash with some metadata, right? Anchor on the blockchain. Okay. So essentially, uh, in my opinion, NFT for ID, uh, identity, is essentially a type of uh, decentralized uh, entity. Okay. And the reason why I started the presentation with definitions is because exactly because now we have a common language about 
these definitions, I can answer it a lot more clearly, okay? So NFT for ID is actually not a replacement or competition competing against decentralized data aggregations, such as verifiable credentials and things like that, okay? It's actually a competitor to uh, open standard called decentralized identifiers. And uh, I think it's, it can be argued that uh, decentralized identifier is better. And I think the Web3 NFT folks are going to argue otherwise. But that said, I think they are very, very similar. And uh, I think decentralized identifier, since it's a tailor, it's a tailor standard for identity use cases, I think uh, it's a lot more flexible. That said, NFT has a lot more market adoptions and hype and, uh, uh, and a lot more usage. So uh, I think it's a, uh, it's something that we shouldn't written off. And I personally think that it's a valid idea, right? To, to uh, actually anchor identities on top, of, uh, uh, on top of blockchain. There's a lot of issues uh, and I can name uh, a couple of them, but at the end of the day, like I said, you know, these challenges are just part of the journey for any new technologies, right? Uh, you can solve it. Like one of the issues will be uh, when you try to mean the NFT, if, if you want to write it on top of Ethereum, it can cost like 20 bucks. Do you want to pay 20 bucks to create a hash? Probably not, right? I mean, that's kind of expensive. <laughs> you know, so so that's one of the issues, but there are new technologies like layer two, layer three, and those kind of side trees uh, um, and those things that can bring the cost down. So there are many, many different problems and I can talk about those in details if you have further questions, but uh, ultimately I think it's a very, it's a valid technology and alternative to decentralized entity. Mm -hmm. Next question over here. Yeah. Okay, this is a terrifying presentation because it brings up so many things. So what happens to information like a DocuSign? I've signed so many contracts and they own that information. Is there a way to, to take back all of that information that's out there? You know, websites that other people that you purchase that hold on to that copyright or that entity? How does that work? So uh, there's multiple questions in your question. Uh, so I'll answer it one by one. So first of all, DocuSign is an e-signature uh, technology and uh, uh, basically it controls uh, uh, public key, uh, private key, right? Kind of uh, asymmetric uh, cryptographies and then allow you to kind of uh, sign a test to uh, this particular public keys. But actually DocuSign, uh, my understanding is it doesn't really tie to your identity that much, right? right? Like, uh, for example, when I sign a uh, digital signature, like, to be very frank, you know, uh, my wife can use my computer to sign it, right? So they don't really tie to your phys physical self. So the authentication um, uh, aspect of e-signature uh, e is actually not there. So, so I think uh, if you're talking about uh, DocuSign or e-signature, as a kind of a pure identity platform, I would argue that uh, it still has some ways to go. Okay, so that's the first part of uh, your question. Now, uh, the second part is um, about uh, data controls and things like that. So, the truth is, uh, data today is inherently decentralized and distributed across multiple systems. Okay, um, so for example, public information. Uh, we actually call public information. So we have a copy, but you, you know what? 40% of the internet traffic is our bots. Okay, so uh, <laughs> there are a lot of companies that cross information. So information is actually uh, distributed and decentralized in the first place. And also more or less um, data about you is not just created by you, right? It can be created by multiple people. So that's another decentralized aspect of data storage, right? And uh, another uh, aspect of the data today. So I think the ultimate way to hold control and power control of one's identity is not through the discussions of who owns what data, okay? It's actually who owns and controls the data access, okay? And that's why I talk about and I highlighted uh, self-sovereign identity, which is in my definition, uh, a way, a new identity access model. I think that's a much better solution to, to uh, uh, self sovereign identity, which is empower users with control uh, and uh, uh, property, right? Ownership of their identity 
I think that's a much better way to do it as opposed to trying to argue about this piece of content owned by whom. Because guess what? In the Uber example that I just gave earlier, do you really own the content or does the person who leave the rating own the content? That's a very, very deep question. Harrison, over here, we have a uh, question online. Hi, Harrison. From Eric online, do you see tracking with any of the data independence platforms helping people get a portion of the revenue made by Google, Facebook, et cetera, by selling their data? So today, a lot of these, uh, so my understanding of the question is about, is there tractions about uh, companies that help users give dividends, like data, dividends to uh, individuals, basically, right? Okay. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> so I've been following this space quite a bit. Um, and uh, this idea has has come up uh, multiple times. And uh, I can tell you at this moment, uh, no one has gained traction. Um, and uh, and I think the main reason is couple folds. Uh, ultimately, it's about the, the benefits from a data subject point of view, from a user's point of view, the benefits uh, do not outweigh the inconvenience. Um, so, uh, for example, a data set, right? A large data set costs about $100,000 uh, a year and spending across like hundreds of millions of people, okay? So how much are you going to get from that, you know, as an individual? You're going to get like 0 0.00, like <laughs> a couple of cents. And then the, 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 the cost, right, the inconvenience, by doing that, like most people will not go through that, right? Go through that friction just for 0 0.0001 cents, okay? So so that I think that's ultimately uh, what's making these uh, technologies not successful, in my opinion. And by the way, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons, uh, possible reasons behind that as well. So does this, can this idea take off in the future? Um, in the dream scenario where uh, aggregations uh, and interoperability between different systems happens, then you can do 0 0.0001 cents forever, right? Times uh, hundreds of thousands of companies leveraging this data, then that dollar amount becomes meaningful. But uh, at this moment, it hasn't happened yet. And uh, these technologies that, uh, that people are thinking about um, hasn't worked. It has been tried multiple times and uh, none of it has taken off. So I actually had a question as well, um, and this one's more international. So we had, you know, privacy or the lack thereof in the United States, China, and Europe, and there's, you know, competing standards and competing practices. Uh, can you comment on how you think that will play out as we continue to globalize? Because people are using Facebook everywhere, people are using WeChat, and we're TikTok everywhere, and so forth. Yeah, I you know. I uh, Long story short, I think it will take a while for this to play out. And the reason is because market adoption uh, usually doesn't rely on compliance reasons. Um, and also uh, usually it doesn't, um, you know, like for example, is decentralization a value prop, a very valid value prop that regular consumers uh, care about, right? Uh, from day to day. Uh, I think the answer is no, right? If I'm creating a, a <laughs> a project and uh, I'm aiming at uh, regular consumers, I'm not going to put decentralized uh, de decentralization as the headline, okay? Because first of all, no one knows what the hell that means and like, what do I care, right? If I'm using, a, 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 for example, a cloud storage, right? I just want to store the data. Like, why do I care whether it's store on Google Cloud or Amazon? I trust Google enough. I mean, they already have all my information anyway, so I trust them quite a bit. So why do I care about this decentralized storage thing, right? So most users, I think decentralization and compliance and these reasons are not the main value prop that drives uh, uh, large consumer market adoptions in my opinion. So what it takes is that these technologies need to be very easy to use. The user experience needs to improve to an extent where it's equivalent or even better than the current solutions. Then um, then I think it can happen. In other words, the technology value props such as decentralization, uh, security, cryptographic, proof, blah, 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 blah. Those are nice to have. Those are icing on cake, but that's not the cake. You know what I mean? 
The cake is still making sure that people are who they say they are, verification. The cake is still search, right? Making sure that the person, you know, is a, is a good one, right? The cake is still marketing, right? Connecting to the right audience. That's the cake, right? And uh, I think what we're talking about here, a lot of value props that people talk about, such as decentralization, distributed ledger technologies and all that stuff, those are just icing on the cake. Yeah. So the main downside today is that uh, the technology is not super easy to use. Okay. And then also there are standards, but the adoption of standards is not huge. So for example, I'll give the example of verifiable credentials. I mean, it's a very beautiful standard. Um, actually, if you read it, it makes you think about the question of identity a lot more. <laughs> it's, a, it's very, very well done. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if there are no issuers, right, issuing credentials or issuing profiles or reports about an individual, right, using verifiable credential standard, that, that standard is just a protocol that no one cares about. You know, if a uh, data cannot be accessible, right, then just zeros and ones in some database. And guess what? A protocol, a standard that no one uses is not very, very impactful. So I think uh, that's uh, that's one of the challenge is the, um, you know, because identity ultimately, I think this is a better way to answer this question. Identity ultimately is a multi-sided platform and any multi-sided platform needs to have a cold start problem, right? And what's a cold start problem? You need to match the supply to the demand, right? And right now, these technologies are very, very nascent and the market adoption is low. So there's a, not a lot of, uh, if everyone's using it, the, the value is huge. But when no one's using it, there's not a lot of value. So it's a very, very classical uh, multi-sided, uh, cold start problem for multi-sided uh, marketplaces and platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question. Um, going on to the last session, um, can you comment on, so to say, the scale of implementation of this technology for identity and active management? And if you cannot point to any specific projects, where do you think are we going to see innovation come from on my assumption that it won't be big tech because it undermines the current business model? Um, but so generally, like, you know, what state are you watching now in terms of innovation? So when you're talking about IAM, uh, identity and access management, are you referring to workforce? I am or customer I am or physical I am. No. Actually, probably B to C. So oh. we can see identify online. Cool. So in uh, customer I am uh, B to C uh, context. So basically, uh, in plain plain English terms, it's basically sign up, logins, registrations, um, and those kind of things. So right now, the current technology are all using what's called a federated uh, identity technologies. And uh, example will be OpenID Connect, OIDC, right? And uh, OAuth 2.0 uh, and, uh, and things like that. Uh, I, I guess you can include SAML, but SAML adoptions are mostly in workforce IAM, not customer IAM. So the cutting edge technologies and uh, the ones that you see in the marketplace today are all using federated identity technologies. They're not using distributed identity technologies or the Web3 technologies. And I think the challenge is, again, very similar to what I talked about earlier is about market adoptions, right? So, uh, so for example, most recently, there's new technologies that came out, new projects that came out that allows people to sign up with their Ethereum wallets, you know, um, but guess what? If you don't have a lot of people who have Ethereum wallets, then uh, <laughs> why would you want to? dedicate a space, right, in your login screen for that, you know. Or in the case of a uh, decentralized identifier, your public key is a long string. Most people don't even know what that, hit, that is, you know. Um, I think most people associate their identity to emails than the uh, Alfred numeric stream, stream that's like, like 36 or 70 characters long, right? So, uh, so you know, I think, um, long story short, um, there, it will take some time for these new technologies to uh, to actually gain market adoptions, and until then, because of this cold start problem, um, I think it'll take it'll take a while. And in the meantime, most of the 
technologies that you see today in the CIM world is still the standard OIDC stuff that uh, people have created since uh, 2005, 2006. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, by the way, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, my my question kind of follows up on on his. So, uh, uh, are there any technologies? You know, we got Jack Burris with his Web five uh, polygon with their uh, with all of, and, and you just mentioned ENS, which, which seems to be gaining a lot of traction. But is there one of the platforms or projects that you feel has the best uh, potential for success from your standpoint? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned about Web5, so we need to actually clarify what that is. So uh, Web5 uh, is what Jack Dorsey uh, and the Twitter folks, right? Uh, sorry, not Twitter, a square, and now called Block. <laughs> they have a division uh, called TBD that came out with this. And the idea is, you know, Web3 is too hype and uh, is a very model definition. So they want to purify that and then create this Web2 plus 3 Fibonacci. Fibonacci series kind of thing, right? Two, three, five, eight, right? <laughs> so that's why they are skipping four. Like people are asking me, like, why playing the world, like it's web five, not web four. That's the reason. Uh, it's web two plus three. And the key idea is actually decentralized identifier. Um, I think it's verifiable potential. And the third one is called decentralized web node. Okay. So these are the three pillars. Um, don't quote me on that though. I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm i getting a little bit older. So uh, no, my memory is not as good. But anyway, so that's basically uh, Web5. Uh, in my definition, it's still Web3, but uh, I respect that marketing terminology. Uh, I think it's kind of, kind of cool, especially I do appreciate Fibonacci uh, series and things like that. So I'm fine with that. I, some, some purists really hate it, but I'm good with it. So anyway, so that's uh, uh, Web5. Um, is really uh, about creating a decentralized web. Okay, so uh, my my presentation and my uh, expertise is actually the identity in Web three, right? So, how do we create like uh, decentralized web application servers and things like that? That's actually not my uh, expertise. So that's that. Um, now, which technologies uh, do I think has the highest chance to? to gain adoptions and the most impacts. Um, I'm not gonna comment on decentralized web nodes and uh, those kind of things because that's not my specialty. Like uh, I do know about distributed file storage like IPFS, but you know, that's the extent of it. Uh, in the context of identity in Web3, I do think verifiable potential is, is what it is. You know, I think that, um, that standard is so well written and embodies so many different concepts, right? I talk, I touch upon a couple of things, right? Uh, transitive trust empowered by digital signatures or cryptographic proof, the segmentation, uh, modularization of presentation concept and credentials. Uh, there's a bunch of them. I think that is the most impactful uh, uh, identity standards uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, it's been a lot of information to, to think about. And it reminds me of a quote that I heard several years ago. And I think this is very relevant to you because you said that you have three kids. And that is, how do you prepare kids for jobs that have not been created? You, uh, for jobs that do not exist, you need technology that has not been created. And I think a lot of what we've been talking about as far as uh, web three is concerned, uh, it is um, relevant to that to that quote. And so going forward, what do you see are some of the more disruptive uh, impact of Web3 and Web5? Uh, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so that's why I think we need to sit down to the core of what Web3 is. You know, um, I don't think Web3 is just about token economics, for example. I'll talk about the don't, and I'll talk about 